All right. Hey there, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's webinar, Hours of Service Rules and Exemptions Affecting Short Haulers. This is an interesting topic as there are many companies who do not do trucking as their main purpose of business, but they're held to various trucking regulations. And many of these companies might not be taking advantage or just don't understand hours of service and its many exemptions. Maybe you are in the construction industry or you are a local moving or delivery company. Uh, we hope that this webinar helps you better understand this dense topic. I'm Luke Kibbe. I'm going to be your moderator today. Before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping items like normal. This webinar is interactive, so please submit your questions in the chat box. I'll keep an eye on them throughout the presentation, and we'll have a Q&A session at the end to answer them. We're also going to mute all the phones, and uh, so again, just please use the chat box. And uh, lastly, you'll receive the presentation in the link of the recording after the webinar. This webinar is being recorded. Uh, so please keep an eye on your email tomorrow sometime. With that, let's get started. I'm excited to introduce industry expert uh, Tony Hugo. He's the safety director at Glowstone Trucking Solutions. Welcome, Tony, and take it away. All right. Thank you, Luke, and good afternoon, everybody. As Luke said, my name is Tony Hugo. I'm the Director of Safety Services here at Glowstone Trucking Solutions. And just a quick little history on myself. Prior to working for Glowstone, I worked for the Oregon Department of Transportation in the Motor Carrier Transportation Division for just under six years. I started as an enforcement officer in enforcing size and weight at Oregon way stations and then moved into the safety department where I conducted roadside inspections and compliance reviews or audits of motor carriers. For today's webinar, we'll be talking about the hours of service exemptions, covering some of the more common exemptions from hours of service from the hours of service regulations set forth by the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration. The first thing I think we need to understand is who do the regulations apply to and take a minute for a brief overview of the hours of service regulations. So who does the hours of service regulations apply to? They're going to apply to anybody that operates a commercial motor vehicle. And the FMCSA defines a commercial motor vehicle in Part 390.5 of the regulations as any vehicle that has a gross vehicle weight rating, gross combination weight rating, gross vehicle weight or gross combination weight of 10,001 pounds or more, whichever is the greater. So it's very important when you're operating a commercial motor vehicle to know the weight rating of your vehicle and um, the actual weight of your vehicle. To determine if you're operating a commercial motor vehicle, the DOT inspector is going to use either the actual weight as the vehicle crosses a scale or look at the manufacturer's sticker usually located on the driver's side door panel or excuse me, door pillar. As I said, it's also important to understand that the DOT, DOT officer is going to use the heaviest weight. So you may have a truck that weighs 9,500 pounds and doesn't qualify as a commercial motor vehicle, but as soon as it has a load in or on the truck, then you may have an actual weight heavy enough to, that it's now considered a commercial motor vehicle. So the image that we have on the screen right now shows various commercial motor vehicles in different configurations. These vehicles are going to range from anything from a semi-truck and trailer or trailers to dump trucks or log trucks and small pickup trucks with trailers or a straight truck with or without a trailer. Um, there's a wide variety of vehicles and combinations that will qualify as a commercial motor vehicle. The next type of uh, commercial motor vehicle is a uh, vehicle that's des designed or used to transport eight or more passengers, including the driver, for compensation. And this is going to be like small buses or vans being compensated for transporting the passengers. And then there's the larger passenger vehicles, like school buses or motor coaches, that are designed and used to transport 15 or more passengers, including the driver, but not for compensation. So that's the differentiating piece there. And then the last vehicle used to transport hazardous materials in any quantity requiring placarding. So if the regulations say you must put placards on the vehicle, you'll need to have a CDL to or you'll need to have a CDL to operate this vehicle. 
To determine if the qu quantity requires placarding, you'll have to reference the hazardous materials regulations, which is another complex topic that we'll cover at a later date. Um, here's an example of a General Motors manufacturer sticker. Again, this can be found on the driver's side door pillar usually. Sometimes it's in the glove box, but most of the time you're going to find it inside the driver's side door. If you just open up the door, you'll find this, the sticker in that area. This example lists the GVWR as 9,500 pounds. As a DOT inspector and in the trainings that I've conducted with Glowstone, I've had a lot of questions similar to those listed here on, the, on this slide. Uh, mainly, what you're going to want to remember is you're looking at the GVWR of your vehicle or combination of vehicles or the actual weight, whichever is the greatest. So the first question is stating the registered weight versus the gross vehicle weight. For the purposes of a record of duty status or during an inspection, you're not going to be concerned so much with the registered weight. It's the GVWR or actual weight that you're going to want to pay attention to. The second question is relative to the example I used earlier. The truck's GVWR is under 10,000 pounds, but the actual weight is going to be over that 10,001 pound limit, so it's going to make the, uh, the DOT would consider this a commercial motor vehicle. The next question, the, the commercial motor vehicle is over 10,000 pounds in combination and considered a commercial motor vehicle when the truck is in the combination. And the last question, the truck and trailer is in combination and over 26,000 pounds, so the driver would need a CDL to operate this vehicle in the com combination that it is in. Um, also, as an example, we've listed the weight of commercial motor vehicles that are required to report to the scales for the states of Oregon and Washington. For Oregon, if you're operating a commercial motor vehicle that weighs 20,000 pounds or more, and in Washington, it's set at 16,000 pounds or more, you must report to the weigh station. Other states may and probably do have various requirements on when the truck must report to the scales. Usually the states will have a sign posted before each scale to inform the drivers when they're required to report to the scales. I know I looked at several other states in the nation, and 10,000 pounds seems to be the more common weight, but just make sure you pay attention to which state you're traveling in and what they're requiring. And then if you are required to maintain a logbook, the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Regulations have a list of minimum required entries. Here we've got a list, the list of the entries and one example of a logbook. So making mistakes or not filling out a logbook properly can lead to a variety of violations, from general form and manner violations to false logs and potentially uh, violations that could place you out of service. While conducting roadside inspections for the DOT, some of the more common errors on logbooks I found were uh, misdating the logs. So sometimes you misdate a log from this kind of an honest mistake. It can result in a false log and could possibly result in the driver being placed out of service for 10 hours. Another common mistake was in the remarks section. Make sure you write very clearly, notating the location, city and state at a very minimum, and the, of the change of duty status location. So just keep in mind that these 11 items are required entries by the FMCSA on your daily log and need to be filled out to avoid possible violations. So now that we know what kind of vehicles and drivers are required to maintain hours of service and what the required entries are on a logbook, let's briefly talk about the basic hour of hours of service. Starting with the 60 and 7 day or 70 and 8 day rule, in order to determine which rule you should follow, if your company does not operate 7 days a week, you should follow the 60 and 7 day rule. If your company is a 7 day a week operation, then you're going to use the 70 and 8 day rule. For either of these rules, you must count all on duty time. This means any time spent driving and any time spent on duty not driving. For each day, uh, for each day, you should, should be used to determine how many hours you've worked in the previous seven or eight days, depending upon which rule applies to you or your company. Your accumulated time over the seven or eight days can be reset back to under zero by taking a 34-hour restart. This is 34 consecutive hours off duty. It's not a mandatory break, 
but it is an option to reset your clock. The next rule is the 14-hour rule, and it basically says you have a 14-hour window to complete all of your drive time, and you're prohibited from driving after the 14th hour. This doesn't mean you cannot work um, past the 14th hour, but you just cannot drive past the 14th hour. And then in, uh, in that 14-hour window of opportunity to drive, you're allowed to drive for a maximum of 11 hours, which is going to be the third clock that, that you have to pay attention to. And the last clock you'll need to pay attention to is the 8-hour clock. So just a little bit more on the 8-hour clock. The 8-hour clock starts when you start your day, not when you start driving. I want to make sure to clarify that. When this rule first came out, there was a little bit of confusion, and I had a lot of drivers that I did inspections on um, that thought that that clock started when they, they started driving. So just remember it's when you start your day, not when you start driving. So if your company is working you on the dock, having you work on the dock, loading trucks for the first five hours of your day, then you start driving, you'll be required to take a 30-minute break within three hours to not be in violation of this rule. Hours of service regulations require that if more than eight consecutive hours have passed since the last off-duty or sleeper birth period of at least 30 minutes, the driver must take an off-duty duty break of at least 30 minutes before driving. Another thing to consider, you're going to want to be careful with how early you take that break. If you take it too early in the day and then work for an additional eight hours and want to drive past that point, you're going to be required to take a second 30-minute break. So just remember, you can't work for more than, you cannot be on duty for more than eight hours and drive past that point without taking a 30-minute break. And as always, there's a few exemptions to this rule. This rule doesn't apply to passenger carriers or short haul operations. For the short haul operations, while you're exempt from the 30 minute break, as long as you meet all the requirements of the short haul provision, if for some reason in the middle of your day you realize that you're going uh, not going to meet the short haul exemption requirements, for example, if you get redispatched and are going to be uh, working more than 12 hours or outside that 100 air mile radius, you'll need to take the 30 minute break as soon as possible, as soon as it's safe to do it, and notate the reason that you took the 30 minute hour break late on your logbook. So if you're going to have to create a logbook at, at that point, you're going to need to take that 30, 30 minute break if it's past the eight hours. So this is a real brief overview of hours of service. It can be very complicated and requires more in-depth conversation and training, but today we're just going to be focusing on the exemptions to hours of service. If you are interested in more hours of service training, we'll have a link at the end of the webinar that will provide more information on additional courses Glowstone offers, including Logbook Mastery. Now that we've very briefly covered which vehicles and drivers are required to maintain a record of duty status, let's move into the various exemptions drivers may use for the hours of service record keeping requirements. The first exemptions we're going to talk about are the short haul exemptions. There's two short haul exemptions, uh, one for non-CDL drivers and one for the CDL drivers. The non-CDL drivers short haul exemption obviously is for drivers that are operating a commercial motor vehicle that do not require a commercial driver's license. CMVs weighing 10,001 pounds to 26,000 pounds. Some of the common types of vehicles I've seen using this non-CDL short haul exemption are going to be moving companies using smaller vehicles and staying relatively close within 150 miles of the city they're based in. And also smaller construction or construction maintenance vehicles. Uh, this exemption relieves the driver of the need to create a grid style daily log but the driver is subject to most of the hours of service regulations, including the 14-hour rule. The driver may not drive beyond the 14th hour after coming on duty, but like everything, there are some exemptions to this, this rule. Two days in a seven-day period, a driver may extend the driving window to 16 hours. 
the driver still can only drive for a total of 11 hours and must take a 10 hour uh, 10 hours off duty in between shifts um, and like all record of duty status uh, they must be maintained for six months if the company or driver is using a time card in place of a logbook the minimum required entries on the time card are going to be the start time end time and total hours of work for that day and the driver must also stay within the 150 air mile radius of their normal work reporting location so now let's move into short haul drivers that have a commercial driver's license commonly referred to as the 100 air mile radius rule or local driving uh, some examples of, of CDL local drivers are going to be dump trucks log trucks or delivery drivers and this rule also relieves the driver of the requirement to maintain a logbook and allows for a time card to be maintained instead as long as all the conditions are met for the short haul exemption and the conditions for the short haul exemption are the driver must be released from work within 12 hours this doesn't mean the driver just does not work after the 12th hour but must be completely released and no longer working after 12 hours they cannot drive for more than 11 hours in that 12 hour period and must have at least 10 hours off in between shifts again as before the time records must be maintained for six months and the time card at a minimum must show the start time end time and total work uh, total hours worked for that day and lastly the driver must stay within a hundred air mile radius of their normal work reporting location so just a real quick recap on the short haul provisions for the non CDL drivers you get a hundred and fifty air mile radius from your normal work reporting location the vehicle will need to be 26,000 pounds or less 14 hour shift time with the exception of two days can be 16 hour days in a seven day period and you must start and stop at the same location for the CDL drivers it's a hundred air mile radius driving a truck over 26,000 pounds a 12 hour shift and start and stop at the same location one additional exemption for the short haul CDL drivers is the 16 hour bonus day a driver that qualifies for short haul operations is eligible for a 16 hour bonus day this will allow the driver to work for up to 16 hours in a day but not more but not drive for more than 11 hours for that day to qualify for the 16 hour day the driver must have reported for work and returned to the same location for each of the previous five duty shifts and have not used this exemption in the previous six days a 34 hour restart will begin a new seven or eight day cycle with that in mind you can have you can use the 16 hour bonus day on a Friday take the next day off as part of the 34 hour restart and when you return back to work for the uh, the 16 hour bonus day would be available to use again in the next few days uh, this exemption can be useful for a company that that has dedicated routes uh, I've, I've uh, usually seen this used by companies delivering their product to various locations assigning a driver specific routes that qualify as local drivers staying under the 12 hours and inside the 150 100 air mile radius say like on Monday through Thursday and on Friday the driver will take a longer route or additional stops that requires maybe a 15 or 16 hour day the driver then has the weekend off and at the time at that time takes their 34 hour restart so when he or she returns back to work the 16 hour day is available again another exemption is uh, a more specific exemption for construction materials and equipment this exemption is obviously very specific to a certain commodity and in industry I wanted to take a minute to focus on this one exemption because in recent years I've been having a lot of questions and concerns about the construction industry which is not a 
traditional motor carrier, meaning driving is not their main business, and how they can comply with the Federal Motor Carrier regulations and conduct their business. So this provision allows for a 24-hour restart instead of 34 hours. 24 consecutive hours off-duty will reset the weekly clock, the 60 and 7 day or 70 and 8 day, back to zero. In all, all the other hours of service regulations that we've already talked about still apply to this, for this exemption. But to qualify for this exemption, you must be operating a vehicle used to transport construction or paving materials like rock, gravel, tar, asphalt, or transporting construction equipment, or transporting construction maintenance vehicles to and from the work site. You're also required to stay within a 50 air mile radius of your normal work reporting location. So one real quick note on normal work reporting location. You can relocate your normal work reporting location. If your company has a work site that's going to require you to be away from home or, or away from the office, uh, for example, let's say you'll need to stay in a hotel for a week. The hotel can become your normal work reporting location. Um, you'd need to complete a record of duty status for the move from your original main office location to the new location because on, on that day you wouldn't have started and stopped in the same location. But once you get to the hotel, that can now become your normal work reporting location for the day as long as you, again, stay within the 100 air miles and are released from duty within 12 hours. And then the return trip, of course, back to your office, you'd have to do a, a logbook. And then lastly, this exemption does not apply to anyone operating a vehicle that is placarded for hazardous materials. So the next exemption you may have used is the adverse driving condition exemption. If unexpected adverse driving conditions slow you down or cause you to um, stop for a while, you may drive for up to an additional two hours to complete what could have been driven in your normal under normal conditions, or reach a place offering safety for the driver and the vehicle. This means you could drive up to 13 hours, which is two additional hours um, than allowed under normal conditions. Some of the adverse driving conditions could be snow, sleet, fog, highway closures or unusual road or traffic conditions, none of which were apparent on the base of, basis of information known to the dispatcher or driver at the time the run was begun. Adverse driving conditions don't include situations that you should have known about, such as congested highway, or highway traffic during typical rush hour periods, or for examples here in the Northwest in the wintertime, the Columbia River Gorge or mountain passes experience extreme, some extreme weather conditions. If the news has been predicting freezing rain or snow in these locations, it would re be reasonable to think that this information should have been known to you before you started your trip, and then you would not qualify for the exemption. On the other hand, the Portland metro area experienced a freezing rain event last December that pretty much gridlocked the entire area. I live just six miles from work, and it took me three and a half hours to get home that night. Um, I don't think anyone could have predicted the effect a glazing of freezing rain on the roadways would have had on the traffic in the Portland area. So in this situation, you would be able to use the exemption to finish your run or reach a safe location, whichever is the shortest time or distance. So the next... Uh, Exemption we're going to talk about is the emergency conditions exemption. This exemption basically says that if, the, if emergency conditions hold you up, you may complete the run that, for that day without being in violation of the provisions of the hours of service regulations. If such run reasonably could have been completed absent the emergency. First, I think it's important to know what the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Regulations define as an emergency. So the FMCSRs define an emergency in Part 390.5 definitions as any hurricane, tornado, storm, high water, wind-driven water, tidal wave, tsunami, earthquake, 
volcanic eruption, mudslide, drought, forest fire, explosion, blackout, or other occurrence, either natural or man-made, which interrupts the delivery of essential services or essential supplies or otherwise immediately threatens human life or public welfare. So in the Pacific Northwest, we generally see this with landslides or forest fires, like we've pictured here. And you can really see why. I wouldn't want to try to drive a vehicle through that kind of smoke and fire on the, on the picture on the right there. Um, in order for these emergency situations to be considered for an exemption, they must also be associated with a declaration of emergency by the President of the United States, the Governor of the state, or an authorized representative having authority to declare emergencies, or by the FMCSA field administrator for that geographical area in which the occurrence happened, or by any other federal, state, or local government officials having authority to declare an emergency. Another way, another time that you may see um, an emergency declared is by a police officer for tow trucks, so it's only going to affect tow trucks to move war, uh, wrecked vehicles or disabled vehicles out of roadways so they can clear the road quickly. If there is a declaration from the president, governor, or an FMCSA representative, um, you're exempt from all hours of service rules for that run as long as the run could have been completed if their emergency had not occurred. So let's switch gears now to electronic logs or ELDs. In our previous two webinars, we talked about the ELDs. The, the first webinar was about um, was what you as a trucking company need to know about the ELD mandate and the good, the bad, and the ugly about ELDs. The second webinar last month was more about what you can expect from a law enforcement perspective and what to expect during a roadside inspection with ELDs. I just want to take a minute to touch on the ELD mandate. All commercial motor vehicles, with a few exceptions, which I'll talk about in a minute, are mandated to have an ELD or automatic onboard recording device installed in their truck by December 18, 2017. And eventually, the only acceptable logging method will be an ELD uh, by the full compliance date of December 16, 2019. The ELD connects to the truck's OBD2 port to record if the truck is in motion and must allow the driver to log in and select on duty, off duty, or on duty not driving. And then the drive time segment must be automatically selected based on vehicle movement. Um, and it also must graphically display a record of duty status so the driver can quickly see hours in the day and provide data in a format that's standardized and can be transmitted to law enforcement in a number of uh, the prescribed ways, such as wireless web services, a USB port, Bluetooth, or email. And then it also has to be provider certified that the device meets the proper proper specifications set forth by the FMCSA. The ELD mandate will apply to all drivers that are required to keep a record of duty status, but as I, but as I said earlier, there are a few exemptions. The first exemption is for the short haul drivers. Short haul and local drivers are going to be exempt from the ELD mandate as long as the short haul driver uses a paper record of duty status for not more than eight days out of a 30-day period. So if you feel there may be times when you may need to keep a log for more than eight days in a 30-day period, for instance, if your company gets busy seasonally and the drivers are working more than 12 hours in the summertime, resulting in the drivers needing to keep a log more often than not, you should have an ELD system installed in your vehicle. The next exemption is for the vehicles manufactured or model year um, prior to the year 2000. If your vehicle is a model year prior to the year 2000, you will not need to have an ELD, 
uh, mounted in your vehicle, but will need to maintain a record of duty status in another format. And the last DLD exemption is for drive-away towaways when the vehicle being driven is the commodity being delivered. One item I think is very important and where I see a lot of violations or citations being issued during a roadside inspection, especially at the start of the ELD mandate, is not having the proper materials in the truck. You must have at a minimum, the user manual for your ELD, an instruction sheet describing the data transfer mechanisms su supported by the ELD, and a step-by-step -step instruction to produce and transfer the driver's hours of service records to an authorized official, and an instruction sheet for the driver describing ELD malfunctions reporting um, reporting requirements and record keeping procedures during ELD malfunctions. In addition to these three mandatory documents, you'll also need to have blank paper logs for eight days in your truck to avoid violations for not having the proper documents for the ELD. During a malfunction, your ELD will need, during a malfunction with your ELD, you'll need to use a paper log to fill in for the ELD. The new ELD mandate only allows a driver to use paper logs for eight days in a row. At that point, the ELD will either need to be repaired or replaced. And then one additional comment is the instruction manual and the two information sheets can be uh, stored electronically on a device like your cell phone or a tablet and count as having them in your vehicle. There's numerous stories that are causing truck drivers to fear or mistrust the ELD systems and the, and the uh, mandate. When reality is that the ELD mandate can help carriers and drivers in some pretty su uh, substantial ways. ELDs can lead to more miles on the road by reducing the hours of service paperwork. Uh, there's no longer a need to stop and fill out a paper log. Um, that should save quite a bit of time. Also, the ELD will round to the nearest minute, not the nearest 15 minutes, potentially saving you, uh, the driver, an estimated 5 to 10 hours a week of drive time. It also will reduce the amount of time and frequency for check-ins with your company. Um, the ELDs can also help you manage and improve your CSA scores. They have an immediate and positive effect on several of the categories, including unsafe driving, by monitoring speed, harsh braking, and other drive, driving behaviors, um, hours of service compliance by monitoring that the drivers uh, by monitoring the hours the driver has remaining, and the, and also can improve vehicle maintenance by monitoring that. The ELD can also provide navigation solutions, offering route mapping options that can optimize fuel and improve. Uh, fuel efficiency, and it'll also help ro roadside inspections, which will become much shorter, more simplified, and uh, less violations from human error, like general form and manner type errors. So let's get into the possible ways a motor motor carrier can avoid potential issues with hours of service violations. As a best practice. These can be especially helpful for a motor carrier that driving is not their primary purpose for operating a commercial motor vehicle. Like moving companies or construction companies that drive a commercial motor vehicle for maybe two hours to the job site, perform the primary work the company is involved in for 10, 10 hours or so on the job site, and then drive the commercial motor vehicle back to the normal reporting location for an additional two hours. Obviously, this is going to put the driver over the short haul exception and potentially over the 14 hour window for the day. Again, these are just a few of our suggestions. Your company may or may not be able to actually apply these. The first suggestion would be to keep the company vehicles at the normal reporting location. 
If you allow your drivers to take a vehicle home and compensate them for the drive time to the office, on duty or drive time could possibly start during the commute to the office using a portion of that 14 hour clock or the 11 hour drive time while the driver commutes to work. It is suggested, suggested to have the drivers commute in their personal vehicle that won't qualify as a commercial motor vehicle to, their, to the office. Another suggestion is to have the drivers stagger their start time. Having each of them start an hour or so apart from each other, the first shift to start the day transports the commercial motor vehicles to the job site, and the other drivers could possibly carpool in a vehicle under the 10,000 pound limit. At the end of the day, the first person on shift would then be a passenger or drive the non-CMV vehicle back to the office and avoid having anyone driving a commercial motor vehicle past that 14th hour. And for the last suggestion, if it's possible, park all the heavy equipment or vehicles or commercial motor vehicles at the job site and having the workers report in their personal vehicles to that job site. By doing this, the short haul drivers or companies can be on, on the job site and utilize the entire day for work and not have to worry about saving time at the end of the day to drive back to the office. Again, these are just some of our suggestions uh, for your company. They may work and may not work, um, or your company may already have some other ideas that they're currently using that aren't listed here. Um, so this pretty much wraps up the our exemptions to hours of service webinar. I'd like to thank everyone for listening and turn it back over to Luke. Thanks again. Awesome. Thank you, Tony. Um, we covered a lot of interesting and somewhat dense information in this presentation. So we're going to be moving to the question and answer time. If you have any questions, please write them down right now. Um, we'll take a look at them and answer them when we get, uh, when we can. Uh, if we run out of time, uh, not being able to answer any questions, we'll just email uh, the answers uh, in, in the follow-up tomorrow uh, with the presentation. Uh, we did get one question during the presentation, Tony. Um, it said, if a driver qualifies for the 100 air mile rule, do they always have to be under 12 hours, or can they occ occasionally go over 12 and log for that day only? So that's a good question. If you, so for the 100 air mile rule, short haul CDL drivers, if you are, so you have to meet all the exceptions to qualify for not completing a logbook. But if you do go over 12 hours for that day, that just simply means that you are no longer exempt from completing a logbook. Now you have to revert back to completing a full logbook for that day. Um, so. The driver should, once they realize or if they know at the beginning of the day that they're going to be going over 12 hours or outside that 100 air mile radius, they should start a logbook as soon as they're aware of that fact and then they're going to be, then they're going to fall under all the hours of service regulations, including that 30 minute break. Um, so basically what that amounts to is if your company is audited and the driver, uh, I saw this quite a bit when I was doing compliance reviews. And companies were doing logbook or excuse me time cards and they write 13 hours for a time card the DOT is going to be looking for a logbook that uh, they're going to be looking for a logbook that corresponds with logbook page that corresponds with that day that they went over that that 12 hour mark um, so that's that's what DOT is going to be looking for. And then if they don't have a logbook for that, it's going to be considered a no rods or no record of duty status for that day. And then that's a violation on the company for the, the audit itself. All right, perfect. Thank you, Tony. Um, you know, I know there's a lot of other exemptions out there. If anybody's got questions on other exemptions that we did not cover, feel free to type them up. We'll wait a couple more uh, seconds uh, for any other questions. Uh, since there's no more, and uh, if not, then we'll move on. So just we'll wait just a couple seconds. All right, so we'll just go ahead and move on. Uh, again, thank you, Tony, um, for this presentation. There's a lot of great information here. 
Um, one of the things Tony mentioned uh, is, is really how much depth there is in hours of service regulations. Uh, we actually offer a four-hour mastery class on logbooks um, and hours of service specifically uh, that you can attend in person or online. Um, our next uh, training actually is um, just a couple of weeks away on May 3rd. So if you're interested, you can sign up at our website. You can either uh, click on the link that you'll uh, get an email tomorrow with this presentation, or you can always visit glowstone.com and uh, look for upcoming webinars in our menu bar. And, uh, and you can also see the other, um, the other upcoming classes that uh, are coming up. I think we had two more in May that are happening. Um, also, if you want to learn more on ELDs, uh, we've done the research for you. Um, you can check out what we've learned at glowstone.com backslash geotab, uh, or you can just even go to our news section um, on our site, and there's a little search bar that you can fill in and just type in ELD. Uh, we've written lots of articles and research on ELDs, things like these presentations we've done the last several months. Um, on, uh, on, on best practices with DLDs, ELD uh, roadside inspections, and, and, and that perspective. So lots of information on our site. And then, of course, uh, uh, take a look at uh, glowson.com backslash geotab. Uh, again, I'll send out the links uh, in, the, in the email tomorrow. And lastly, there's going to be two more webinars coming up. Uh, one is with our sister company, Clean Fleet. Uh, they're a drug and alcohol testing company. Um, and uh, this is actually Thursday, two days away, um, and it's going to be covering what is oral saliva testing and why should I care, uh, especially for those uh, with employees federally regulated by the DOT. Uh, it's going to be interesting because oral saliva testing is, is on the radar right now, uh, potentially in October, you know, again, give or take the, the government uh, slowness at times, but we are expecting around the end of the year that oral saliva testing might be available uh, for, for uh, DOT companies um, to use in certain situations. So it's a great one that you can go uh, register for, and that's two days from now. And the next webinar for Glowstone uh, in May, it's going to be May 16th, and it's titled, I'm Being Audited by the FMCSA, Now What? Um, as you know, the FMCSA is a uh, uh, Comprehensive safety analysis guarantees most every motor vehicle will be scrutinized for safety compliance on a monthly basis. Uh, with this scrutiny, adds to your chances of being audited. So um, we're going to talk about the, that process, what companies can do um, you know, once they start receive that letter, what they can do, and, and what should they do. Uh, so you can go to cleanfleet.org/monthlywebinar. Uh, and same thing, glowstone.com backslash monthly webinar, um, or, you know, like I said, uh, we'll send out these slides and the links uh, to the emails tomorrow. With that, we're going to go ahead and wrap up the webinar. Uh, thank you all for attending, and uh, we hope to see you next month. Have a great rest of your day, and uh, again, see, see you guys later. Thank you.